Okay, hello everyone. We are live uh, and we would like to start our webinar. The webinar today, as you will know, will be rapid optimization of lipid nanoparticles using microfluidics, formulation, process and equipment. My name is Julia Raj Bestep. I'm VP of uh, R&D and Alliance Management at Phosphorex and I will be your host and moderator of this webinar. The speakers will have both representing Dolomite, uh, Dr. Kate O'Brien and Phosphorex, Dr. Nicholas Boylan and Dr. Nicholas Carabin, and they will uh, share the insights about important considerations uh, when making polymeric particles uh, with microfluidics. So the outline of the webinar will be first, Kate will get us started and she will talk about Dolomite and PS Microfluidic Automated System. Um, and Kate would introduce a few polls first. And then we will see a pre-recorded case study on how to make this lipid nanoparticles using NPS system uh, pre-recorded by Nick Carabin. And that's pretty much as close as possible for you to visit our lab and see how this LNP systems are done in real life. Um, and uh, then we will kick off the presentation from Fosworks. I will kick it off and talk about some development aspects of making this lipid nanoparticles. And then uh, I will turn it to Nick Boylan who would uh, take it in depth on the formulation, a little bit of history, fabrication aspects and process aspects, and then we'll have three polls. A uh, few housekeeping items. We really want uh, this webinar to be as interactive as possible, as interactive as technology allows us, and we have a lot of tools here. Um, and um, uh, please get familiar with the interactive icons on the side. So we have the chat and you can put your comments. That would be greatly appreciated. Uh, and also please participate in the polls as much as possible. It really helps us to get an information from you, what you're looking for, and then we can put, put the better content for the next time. We definitely listen to you. Uh, the most important thing is the panel with the questions. Uh, uh, with the questions, at the end we we'll have Q and A session, and uh, we really want the best part of this webinar is getting through the questions and answers and being interactive. So uh, please put your questions in one place where the questions are, so it's easier for us to find all of them in one place. Um, so without further ado. Uh, I'll turn it to uh, to Kate O'Brien. Kate, please. Thank you, Yulia. Yeah, so we're just going to kick start with a, a few polls, um, just to get an idea of our audience and what um, you guys are working in. So at the moment, uh, you should be able to see a poll question uh, that looks at the volumes that you currently use um, when you're making LMPs. So at the moment, we've got quite a lot of people have voted to say that they're using greater than two mils as a uh, sample volume um, and then some people kind of using the 0.5 to 2 mil um, as the the two most popular um, question uh, answers so far of, of the audience. So still getting some uh, votes in so I'll just give you everyone a couple more minutes a couple more seconds sorry. Um, I think 60% now of the audience are, are looking at using greater than two mil sample volumes um, and interestingly no one using less than 0.1 milliliters I guess that's a quite a small volume to be uh, to be working with cool so the next one um, will load momentarily for everyone and then we've got one more after that um, so this one is um, what LMP size you are targeting um, during your production? 
So at the moment, most people are voting between the 50 and 100 nanometer size range. As a 65% of our our audience are, are looking at that range, and then a few people either side, so the 20 to na 50 nanometers and the 100 to 200 nanometers are also fairly popular answers at the moment. We've still got quite a few uh, votes coming in, so I'll give everyone a couple more seconds to answer that question. Great. And then the final one, uh, which is similar to the first one. So what sample volumes would you ideally like to produce before you dilute it, before you work it up? before any characterization. Um, and at the moment, most people are, again, greater than two nils for the sample volume. Um, but more people are also actually asking for 0.5 to two mil um, when you're in your sample screening phase, um, which is really interesting to see. Give everyone a, a few more seconds just to, to make their choices on this vote, on this poll. And then I'll kickstart my um, presentation momentarily. Thanks to everyone for voting in that. Great, so um, let's get the webinar started. So. Thank you for joining us today uh, on our webinar about rapid optimization of mRNA LMPs using microfluidics. Um, as everyone is probably very well aware, uh, nanoparticles have been used very widely uh, over the last decade or so as an excellent drug delivery method for a range of ingredients. And specifically, sorry, uh, specifically LMPs have been used as drug delivery vehicles due to their, their cell-like structures, you can see in this figure on the, on the right-hand side. And this gives them really good biocompatibility, so it allows them to be uh, taken up in, in cells quite easily. Microfluidic production methods have uh, started to gain a lot of, um, a lot of attract, attraction um, to produce LMPs. Uh, and one of the methods you can use is hydrodynamic flow focusing, which uh, you can see in this figure. And this uh, produces LMPs by uh, controllably introducing an anti-solvent, so in this case uh, aqueous phase, uh, which changes the solubility of the lipids in, in your organic phase, which initializes the, the LMP self-assembly. The, they've got a lot of uh, benefits over bulk production methods, and that's due to a much greater control over the, the self-assembly process that I just mentioned. And this gives a really low PDI of your uh, nanoparticles that you produce, high encapsulation efficiency, uh, but the ability to work with very small sample sizes. So in the in the range of kind of two mil, like every, uh, that we saw was really popular in the poll just now. However, there are some drawbacks to microfluidics, um, and this is generally around the difficulty in rapidly optimizing nanoparticles. So it's quite hard to vary flow conditions. So if you change the total flow rate or the flow rate ratio, you generally lead to a loss of sample uh, during the change in those conditions, uh, which you can't collect basically. And then if you want to change your cargo or LMP formulation, you basically have to manually break down your microfluidic system to perform uh, efficient cleaning steps, um, which obviously, really just slows your workflow um, and is difficult to rapidly optimize your nanoparticles as I just mentioned. So dolomite microfluidics were well placed. We've had a, a number of decades in the microfluidic phase um, and we were well placed to develop the automated nanoparticle system which you can see here and this um, was produced to overcome some of those downfalls that I've just mentioned. And I'll go into the why uh, on the next slide, but just to give you an introduction to the system. The system comprises of these two sample loops, one for your cargo phase and one for your um, LMP phase or your lipid precursor phase. And these are connected to your automated sample valves, which uh, aliquot predetermined volumes into the whole the microfluidic system to produce your LMPs. 
These aliquots are pushed round the uh, fluidic pathway by the use of your METOS quad pumps, of which there are three. So one for your aqueous phase, one for your organic phase, and one for your dilution phase. And these uh, quad pumps are fed from the pressurized input store, which can house up to 250 mil of your driver fluid. The aliquots that have been um, moved into the fluidic pathway uh, are accurately um, flown through the system to the microfluidic chip here and this is where the LMP production is initialized uh, in a very controlled manner to ensure that you've, you've achieved the mixing that you've set out in the software. And then we have the op optional inline dilution chip um, as the second microfluidic chip. And then the timing of the system, because it is so precise, it allows for the collection of your aliquoted um, sample loop volumes um, via the automated collector and any driver fluid that are, is in front or behind the sample loop is, is diverted to waste. We will see um, in the demonstration video that Phosphorex uh, have recorded a bit more about the system and you'll get a kind of an overview of, of how it works basically. But as I said, the uh, AMP system is, was generate was produced, sorry, to overcome some of those downfalls in microfluidic production and allow for rapid LMP generation. And it does this um, for a number of reasons. So the first, the, those sample loops that I mentioned earlier, they allow for multiple experiments to be queued. So for example, if you're using 500 microliter inputs from each five mil sample loop, you can queue 10 experiments and that would produce a, a one mil sample for each um, experiment and that is before dilution. These experiments will have the same reagent inputs, but you can have discrete flow conditions, so you can have different flow rates and different um, flow rate ratios. The automated protocol means that the only manual step is loading those sample loops. Uh, everything else, so the, the operation of the METOS quad pumps and the switching of the ASVs are automatically controlled in the software. And then we have automated cleaning cycles between each experiment that you've queued in a protocol, but also at the end of the protocol, which, which means that after a protocol is finished, you can uh, load your next set of reagents, so a change in your cargo or a change in your uh, LMP formulation very easily without any extra manual steps required. So just to show you how quick the system can be, um, we can see here, this is what a a pressure readout from one of the pumps looks like. So here the, the system isn't really doing anything for the first couple of minutes and that's because the protocol has paused to allow you to load your samples manually and as soon as you've confirmed that the, the, in the software that you've done that it will then prime the system which basically means that the entire fluidic pathway is wetted with your driver fluids before the first experiment takes place and then a wash cycle um, occurs. And then this is repeated for as many uh, experiments you've queued in your protocol. And then finally, we have the full wash system that I mentioned um, previously, which um, takes a couple of minutes, but after your final experiment has performed around, been performed around the 15 minute mark, you can actually take your samples off the system right now uh, and process them for any characterization you've got um, that you want to perform. So here you can see that these 10 experiments took less than 20 minutes and this was with a total flow rate of 12 mil a minute. The highest flow rate that you can run with the system is actually 15 mil a minute, so you can make this a bit quicker if you chose to. Um, so that's a very quick um, introduction to the AMP system and we can now um, move on to... Please, please, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think that there's some questions coming. And I would like yeah. to ask you just one really quick question. Uh, yeah, sure. I think it's a quick question. <laughs> Can you use, I think it would be helpful before the demo to talk about this. Can you use other microfluidic geometry with the ANPS system? Yes, so any of the chips that Dolomite Microfluidics produce can be used um, with the AMP system, the way that we connect the chips is ubiquitous across all chips, uh, across um, every chip, so that it basically plug and play with the AMP system. Uh, if you choose, at the moment we've got kind of a cross junction, but we also have micromixers which um, 
segment the flow, which some people use quite a lot in LMP production. So yeah, it's, it, it's really easy to swap them out basically. Thank you, thank you. And with that, back to you and you can introduce Nick. Yeah, Sorry. no worries. So now we have a, a quick video on uh, the AMP system in PhosphorX's lab. Today, we'll be running through a quick demonstration using the Dolomite Automated Nanoparticle System to highlight how this system can quickly be used to scan and select manufacturing parameters to prepare lipid nanoparticles. In today's demo, we'll go over how to open the software, set up the instrument, set up an experimental table, and then lastly, how to process your sample upon manufacturing. Before jumping into the software, let's take a look at the different modules that compose the Dolomite ANPS. We have our pressurized input storage rack. We have our Midos automated sample valve. These lower two modules are our two quad pumps. Note that each quad pump has two pairs of syringes. Each pair of syringes represent a separate pump. So between the two modules, we have a total of four pumps. And then lastly, we have our Gilson automated collector. After turning on each of the modules, we're ready to start operating the ANPS. Open the software by double-clicking the Dolomite Flow Control icon. After opening the software, click on the Devices tab, where six subscreens should appear. One subscreen for the Gilson collector, one for the dilution pump, one for our lipid pump, one for our spare pump, one for our cargo pump, and lastly, one for the automated sample valve. Feel free to drag and drop these subscreens to orient your field of view to your liking. For each of the four pump modules, click the initialize button. Once the initialization step is complete, we're going to wet our system with ethanol and buffer and confirm that there are no leaks along the flow path. To do so, I typically run a timed pump. So I'm going to adjust my fill, empty, and pump rates for my lipid pump as well as for my cargo pump. Then I'm going to adjust the length of this timed pump input from five minutes down to three minutes. And once these parameters have been set to your liking, feel free to initiate the timed pump. After the timed pump is complete and you've confirmed that your system is leak free, transition from the devices tab to the protocols tab. At PhosphorX, we have two predefined protocols that we utilize frequently. We have our default lipid nanoparticle protocol and our default polymer nanoparticle protocol. For today's demo, we'll be focusing on the lipid nanoparticle protocol. Note that when you open up the protocols window, there are two sections that require user input. This top section requires that a device be assigned to each of these five functions. So in this case, our automated sample valve is defined as our MITOS. Our collector is defined as our Gilson collector one. Note that we have defined the sample one pump to be our lipid pump, the sample two pump to be our cargo pump, and lastly, our dilution pump is obviously dilution. After assigning these devices to these functions, shift your focus to this lower window where you need to define system parameters. In this window, the first two parameters are relatively general. So for the protocol that we'll be using today, we are not using inline dilution and therefore our dilution pump has been set to no. We've set our wash rate here to three mils per minute or 3000 microliters per minute. And now the next four values will be system specific. So these four values are the volume of tubing going between two points. So in this case, the volume between valve one and the chip is 249 microliters from valve two to the chip is 304 microliters. 
from the chip to the dilution T, we have set to zero because as you recall, we are not using inline dilution for this protocol. And then lastly, from the end of the dilution T to the Gilson is set to 294 microliters. And for our protocol, as there is no dilution T, this is really the volume going from the exit of the chip to the Gilson. Once you've defined the inputs in the top and lower panels, you're now able and ready to edit your experimental table. To do so, simply click edit. Once the table editor window opens, you can now add multiple experiments in a single run on the ANPS. Note that each experiment, which is defined as a separate row, has several inputs. Moving from left to right, for a single experiment, you'll need to define the sample one pump flow rate. And if you recall, we've defined our sample one pump to be our lipid pump. So this is the lipid flow rate. Your sample two pump flow rate, which in this case is our aqueous or cargo flow rate. Your dilution pump flow rate, the sample one volume for injection and collection, which in this case is the volume of lipid that will be injected and collected per sample. The volume of a heads cut, if you choose to use one, the volume of a tails cut, if you choose to, to use one. And then lastly, your sample name. If you'd like to add an additional experiment to your table, simply click this green cross, which is the add row button. And if you'd like to remove an experiment from this table, simply click on the experiment, hit this red subtraction button, which is the remove row button. Note that for today's demo, we have four experiments that we'll be completing in a single run. Note that these experiments have been listed as demo one, two, three, and four. Now, all of these samples have the same lipid volume that we'll be injecting and collecting, which is 220 microliters. They all have the same total volume as we're keeping the flow rate ratio constant at five, but we are varying these four samples on their total flow rate. So we're testing samples with a total flow rate equal to four, three, two, and one mil per minute. Once you are content with your inputs, simply click okay. And to begin the experiment, click start. Note, as the experiment works its way through the protocol, you'll be able to track the progress in this output log on the right-hand side of the screen. Once the protocol has filled its pumps and wet the system, you'll be prompted to inject the required volumes for your sample one and sample two. Note that for our four sub-experiments, we need to inject at least 880 microliters of lipid into sample loop one. And note for our cargo, we need to inject just about 4,400 microliters of sample into sample loop two. After injecting these volumes, simply click OK to continue on with your experiment. As the protocol progresses, the Gilson will adjust its position to collect sample in its designated sample two. As depicted here, the Gilson has now moved over the second centrifuge tube and is collecting sample two in our experimental list. Once the manufacturing protocol is finished, which in this case takes just over 22 minutes, you're now ready to collect your four samples and process them. At this scale, we typically utilize dialysis to remove our ethanol and transfer our sample into our target buffer solution. So in this case, I've loaded a syringe with one of our four samples. I'm going to inject this into one of our dialysis cassettes. After injecting the sample, we'll remove as much of that headspace as possible before transferring our sample within the dialysis cassette into our target buffer. We'll then cover this beaker, transfer this beaker onto a stir, part, stir plate set at 4C, and we'll let dialysis take place overnight. The next day, uh, we'll remove our sample from the fridge, transfer the sample that was once in the dialysis, dialysis cassette into our A-Micon centrifuge tube, and we'll use centrifugation to concentrate our sample down to a target volume, at which point we're now ready to remove an aliquot for DLS analysis and a second aliquot for ribogreen analysis. Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you. Thank you for this virtual tour. Hopefully everyone enjoyed that. So with that, let's switch to the presentation from Phosphorex.
Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce a little bit more about the POSFEX. Now we're switching gears from focusing on the equipment to the focusing on the formulation, analytical development and process. Uh, so POSFEX is a contract research organization specializing in drug delivery with the focus on the particle-based technologies. Uh, we're located outside of Boston, about half an hour, and our capabilities include formulation, analytical lab, process development, all the way to GLP manufacturing. Phosphorex has developed a comprehensive approach to optimization of lipid nanoparticles formulation uh, and streamlining transition into the clinical manufacturing. So our clients come to us and they are in different stage of the project development. If they are very early on, then we involved in the formulation design and prototyping and also including optimization of the small-scale formulation. In some cases, this activity is already done and the client is like kind of like mid-stage development and focusing on help with the development. In this case, we would work together on the scale-up process development and optimization of the large scale, and then we will help to produce GLP batch to support IND enabling preclinical studies. And we also support GMP manufacturing via the tech transfer. Uh, our customers come across different industry segments. We work with pharma, with biotech, uh, animal health, diagnostic, and material research science. We have industry and academic partners. And we work with projects across very broad range of therapeutic indications, of course, a lot in the oncology, immune oncology, rare disease vaccines, but there are also others. Um, we, we're, we are focusing on the development. That's what we, we try to put a D uh, from the very beginning. So um, wherever we work on the optimization of the formulation and the process, we look at this through the development lenses. What exactly does it mean, the development? So here we call just a few major points. So start, the first one is to start with the end in mind. It's never too early to start thinking about the product concept. Of course, we're utilizing stage approach. We're not planning to doing all the development activities, but at least at least have it in the back of your mind and use it as a paper exercise. Very important tool is to start working on the target product profile. And typically we'll lay out the one that is desired, but also the one that minimally acceptable. And which includes pharmaceutical or dosage form TPP, but also clinical and commercial. So um, for example, stability of the LNP formulation, we propose to use as one of the criteria uh, for, the, uh, for the lead formulation selection. We've seen some cases when instability was discovered very late in the process and the partner needed to go back and reformulate. Process. Process is very important. Understand the process unit operations, critical, critical process parameters, effect of scale. Um, our mantra is the process is the product. Due to the nanoparticle complexity, the best way is to control the product, is to control the process, rather than rely on very elaborate analytics. And that would help to avoid redundant comparability work if you establish the process before getting into the clinic. And the last but not the least, of course, to choose partner uh, who has the experience and work with them. And they would work together on the selection of the process and the equipment, understanding equipment requirements and constraints. It will help you to save the time and resources and in the long run, to increase probability of the success. 
So our approach here is to develop formulation process and analytics in parallel. Clearly, they are interconnected. And um, we, as we develop the product, we pay, pay attention to the process very early, and we develop appropriate analytical methodology that allows us to monitor both the formulation and the process. So with that, I will send it back to Nick Boylan and he will take you through the history of the lipid formulations um, and in-depth take on the lipid nanoparticle formulation and the process. Thank you, Julia. Hi, my name is Nick Boylan. I'm the Associate Director of Product and Technology Development here at Phosphorix. So I'm going to walk us through the rest of the slide deck and then lead us into a few additional poll questions before we get to our, our question, question and answer session. And so first, just want to kind of highlight that with the, the success of COVID vaccines, right, this has really brought the LMP technology to the limelight. Uh, but their success is really grounded upon decades of work uh, that's been conducted in various fields, in, including drug delivery and also immunology. And likewise, this is an exciting time as we see kind of the, the expansion of potential therapeutic areas for this technology and the treatment of other diseases such as uh, oncology and also autoimmune disorders, just to name a few. And so with regards to lipid-based drug delivery systems, some of the common morphologies you might encounter include liposomes and lipoplexes. Um, but again, for today's conversation, the, the focus will be on the, the lipid nanoparticle as depicted on the right-hand side. And LNPs are composed of four key structural components. Uh, each one of these plays a critical role in the, the formation and, and stability and, and performance of the formulation. Uh, but just a quick note on the ionizable lipid. One of its key attributes is the ability to be protonated or positively charged under slightly acidic conditions. And this is important during the self-assembly process as it facilitates the encapsulation of our negatively charged uh, RNA cargos. And, and likewise, upon internalization into cells through the endolysosomal pathway, uh, which is a slightly acidic environment, uh, these positively charged ionizable lipids can facilitate interaction with the negatively charged lipid bilayer. And this can lead to things such as membrane fusion and disruption and essentially escape from that uh, degradative uh, tra trafficking pathway. And so as both Kate and, and Nick pointed out earlier, uh, microfluidics plays a key role, especially at the smaller scale screening phases, and in the sense that right, we have uh, control of the mixing process, and it's also very material sparing as well. And, and as they pointed out, there are two critical process parameters here, including both the, the total flow rate and also the flow rate ratio. And we'll provide some examples in a few slides as, as how we go about uh, optimizing these parameters. So taking a look at the self-assembly process in a little bit more detail. So here we have the, the lipids dissolved in ethanol entering on the top left. And then we have our RNA cargo um, in our aqueous, uh, slightly acidic buffer entering on the, the bottom left. And again, in the microfluidic chip, we have the controlled mixing. And there are two factors that lead to the, the self-assembly. One is change in the solvent polarity and, and also that slightly acidic pH, which, which again promotes the, the protonization of our ionizable lipids. And then post downstream processing through dialysis and, and amicon centrifugation, for example, uh, we essentially end up with our final LMP with our encapsulated RNA cargo as depicted on the, the right hand side. And so here at Phosphorix, again, we employ the AMP system, um, especially for our early stage screening processes. And, and this is due to sort of the efficiency of the system and, and kind of material sparing uh, properties as well. And as Julia pointed out, um, even before we kind of get started in the lab, we like to work with our partners and really identify what the ideal product candidate looks like. And this comes in the form of our Atari product profile or TPP. And here's just an example table where we, we basically try to identify, you know, what are the, the appropriate particle size, polydispersity, you know, what type of payload are we trying to encapsulate? You know, what's our acceptable level of encapsulation efficiency? 
and as well as uh, how do we plan on storing this material and, and what stability requirements are are required and, and this is important especially as we get ready for preclinical testing say in, in animal animal models right where we need to basically manufacture store this material and also be able to ship it to the, the testing facilities so in terms of some of the the downstream unit operations if you will um, for, for fabricating LMPs, and th this is relevant even for your small-scale screening processes, um, you know, you're going to have various steps, including uh, solution prep, and, and then likewise the, the microfluidic mixing step, and as, as Nick already pointed out, for the buffer exchange and, and concentration steps, at, at small scales, you'll likely be using dialysis and a mic on ultrafiltration, and then for any material that's destined for in vivo, right, will employ a, a terminal sterile, sterile filtration step. And so for each of these unit operations, there are gonna be a number of, of process parameters. And, and some of these are really critical um, as they directly impact the, the quality attributes of the final product. And it, it, they may impact things like size, polydispersity, you know, encapsulation efficiency, um, but also the stability and, and the final yield is of the material as well. And so after running our kind of formulation screen and say we've identified some lean form formulation candidates that we want to proceed with in preclinical testing, um, again, we'll use very similar unit operations, but at this point, Phosphorix uh, strongly recommends transitioning to tangential flow filtration or TFF for the buffer exchange and concentration steps. And, and we'll kind of highlight some, some of the benefits in the next couple slides, but um, in short, it's, it's a much more efficient and scalable process. Uh, but also it comes with its own kind of list of, of process parameters and again these need to be optimized in order to kind of have the optimal final particle size and stability for example um, and again the sterile filtration step is, is critical and, and throughout this process we're always kind of looking to kind of assess the, the product stability under the appropriate storage conditions so here we have a example data set that was generated using the ANP system, kind of at our small scale, kind of high through screening process. And in, in this case, we were looking at the effect of, of the total flow rate and flow rate ratio on both the, the particle size and also encapsulation efficiency. And, and here we have it, it illustrated for two, two different lipid systems. So the first one is uh, utilizes the cationic lipid DOTAP in the top panels. And then we also have the ionizable lipid uh, DODMA in the bottom panels. So as you can see on the right hand side, uh, by just adjusting our total flow rate, we're able to kind of target LMPs in a size range of say like 80 nanometers up to 200 nanometers. Um, but when it comes to encapsulation efficiency as determined by Rabo Green, you'll, you'll note that with the DOTAP based system, we were essentially at 96% or greater encapsulation efficiency across the board. But for DODMA, we we needed to either optimize the flow rate ratio and or the, the total flow rate to achieve encapsulation efficiencies, say, of 90% or greater. I mean, again, this just kind of highlights, you know, using the A&P system, how we can quickly scan the space and, and identify appropriate processing parameters to move forward with. So taking a look at a little bit more detail of the downstream unit operations, so, so again, we, we employ uh, tangential flow filtration, and we try to do this as, as early in the process as, as possible. And just as an example, with some of our smaller scales, we can work with um, you know, as little as a half meg of RNA cargo, for example. And there's some key benefits here, including the, the collection of kind of real-time data that tells us kind of uh, the performance of the process uh, at various stages of the process as well. And by collecting this data, even with the small scale batches, uh, this really enables us to one, kind of assess reproducibility, robustness. Um, it also puts us in a better position when we go to scale up the, the formulation further, whether it's generating larger scale batches, say for preclinical testing and non-human primates, or even kind of generation or of, of clinical grade material and via uh, GMP uh, tech transfer. Uh, so in addition to, um, Kind of having expertise with TFF development for lipid nanoparticles. Uh, Phosphorix also has a lot of expertise using this uh, for purification of both polymeric nano and microparticle based, based drug delivery systems. And we've successfully developed these, these uh, processes and, and transferred them to CMOs for GMP batch production. 
So in addition to TFF, we also have um, significant expertise in-house with cryoprotectant selection. And this is important whenever you want to prepare, say, a frozen suspension of the drug substance or drug products. And then also in the case, if, if you want to try to develop a lyophilized uh, based uh, drug product as well. And then finally, uh, sterile filtration is critical. Um, you know, one, in, to ensure sterility of the final products. Um, but here you also want to have good yield of your product as well, right? And, and so we have a lot of expertise in, in optimizing that unit operation as well. And so here's just a quick example data set uh, for, for TFF um, for both the, the concentration of the LMP suspension and also performing the buffer exchange through what's known as uh, diet filtration. And so the schematic on the, the bottom left uh, basically illustrates here we have a feed reservoir which contains our LMPs and this, this would be basically the material post mixing say through the microfluidic mixer. And then we have a parasaltic pump, which basically pumps that solution through, in this case, a, a hollow fiber TFF membrane. And then depending on the, the molecular weights of the, the materials in solution, um, for the larger molecular weight material, including our LMPs, that's recirculated back to the feed reservoir through the retentate line, whereas uh, any impurities such as the ethanol or buffer salts can, be, can actually kind of pass through the membrane and exit as a waste stream in the form of the permeate line. And so one of the benefits of having these systems is one, they can be automated, um, but we also record data um, real time, including just for example, the pressures at the inlet, permeate and retentate sides of the TFF column. And, and by having this data in hand, this can allow us to kind of troubleshoot, assess reproducibility and, and also scale up this, this process readily. So with regards to uh, analytics and, and our capabilities internally at, at Phosphorix, um, so here's just a list of, of some of the, the typical analytical methodologies, and we can always expand this list um, depending on our, our partner's needs. Um, but for size analysis, right, we'll typically use uh, dynamic light scattering and then ribogreen to quantify both total and encapsulated RNA. We have the ability to, to run HPLC with charged aerosol, de aerosol detectors for, for lipid analysis and then sterility testing. You know, we can perform those assays, and, and I think one of the the most important parts here is, is the stability testing of the final product. And we have experience both as a, a liquid suspension, but also frozen suspensions. And then to assess the, uh, the efficiency of our TFF process, we can, we can also evaluate any residual ethanol content in our, in our final product. And we can also select these analytical methodologies in a very stage appropriate manner. Um, so just for example, at early stage, you, you know, we'd primarily be looking at particle size by DLS and encapsulation efficiency by ribogreen, and, and also getting an early read on the stability of the material as well under various storage conditions. And then as we trans, uh, kind of transition, right, we have a lead, op, lead formulation that we're optimizing for preclinical testing, right? We're going to add in things such as uh, residual solvent analysis to assess the, the efficiency of TV, TFF. And then also doing sterility testing, right, to make sure we have a clean process and deliver a uh, quality material to our animal CRO. And then likewise, as we kind of move towards more kind of IND enabling studies and, and even kind of developing the process and tech transfer to CMO for GMP batch production, right, we're gonna have additional assays um, such as kind of lipid identity and purity analysis and maybe also particle morphology by cryo-electron microscopy. And, and with regards to stability testing, again, this is kind of one of the, the critical parts of the process. And, you know, we can monitor, again, certain attributes um, between various unit operations, say post-mixing, you know, post-buffer exchange, right? Definitely monitoring things like size, um, but then also, you know, looking at our encapsulation efficiency and how that might change both uh, post kind of buffer exchange concentration and also post-sterile filtration, right? Are, are there any trends there? And then finally, again, looking at residual solvents and in sterility testing. And then, then again, confirming the, the stability of the, of the products under the appropriate storage conditions, um, right? Whether it's uh, refrigerated or frozen. So in summary, um, you know, the successful LMP development really requires a rational and thoughtful approach. And in, in parallel, we, we basically need to streamline both the, the formulation process and, and analytical development workflows. And this is really critical as we transition, you know, from the earliest kind of feasibility stage 
uh, work, you know, through preclinical and, and working towards kind of GMP batch fabrication. And as Julia pointed out, you know, the product is the process and, and having the ability to control each of these unit operations is really key uh, for, for the success of the project. So with that, we'd really love to hear from you. So if you have any questions with the material or content presented today, or if you'd like to just inquire more about Phosphorix's capabilities in the space, please reach out to us either at the info line at phosphorix.com, or you can contact uh, Julia or myself directly. So thank you very much for your attention today. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nick. As, uh, as Nick said, we would love to hear from you. Would like to learn more about the, your projects, and we're happy to answer any questions about either dolomite, about the equipment, about the formulation and the process. And with that, we'll take a few questions, and then we'll go into the. We'll go um, and do the. Okay, we'll do the polls first, and then we'll answer a few questions. So the first poll is what do you see as the largest challenge for LNP production development? Please, we really want to hear from you. Okay, so we're seeing some, some answers flowing. Majority of you seeing microfluidic scalability. I cannot agree more. Um, and the second, GMP manufacturing. Uh, please, we'll wait for a few more answers. 59% for microfluidic scalability, 21% GMP manufacturing, downstream processing, absolutely, and analytical testing. Okay, next poll, please. What LNP scale do you need to support your clinical study or testing? Please answer and we'll share uh, the aggregate with the group. Interesting, majority of the group is still in the discovery stage, uh, 100 meg RNA DNA. We know the materials are very difficult to obtain and pricey. And then, but 11% is at one gram scale or more. So the, the, the whole spectrum. Um, thank you for sharing. We'll wait a few more answers, please. That would be very helpful for us. And now we can move to the third poll. When do you plan to launch GMP production of LNP for clinical studies? Six months within a year, one to two years, more than two years. We're waiting for the answers. Ah, huh? majority of you see within a year, some more than a year, two years, but majority of you in one to two years. Very, very nice. Okay, thank you. So now we can move into the questions. And the first question will go to um will go to Kate. Um what if I have more or less than five milliliter uh, for a sample input? Kate? Yes, please. so the AMP system is supplied as standard with the five mil sample loops. But we also have a one mil sample loop, and we are currently in the process of releasing a ten mil sample loop. So it can really scale with your your production and and the volumes that you're working with. Thank you very much. I Thank can you. add on to that really quick too, just to kind of complement, um, you know, mm -hmm. Phosphorix's experience with the system. And and so when we say five mils or one mil, this is sort of the the max volume you could load. Um, but you, you could load, say, if, if you only want to use 200 microliters of, say, your lipid base, you know, you could load just 200 microliters or a little bit extra, right? Um, just want to kind of clarify that point. So, again, this is like our, our upper limit on how much would one single injection on the system. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Kate, and maybe you can take this one. How much mRNA input is typically used for 2 mil LNP production run? 
what is the typical final encapsulation efficiency, how many uh, that maybe phosphorus can jump in, how many mouse in vivo doses a two mil production typically provide after dialysis and concentration. For sure. So it, it's definitely dependent on your LMP formulation that you're using. Um, and any LMP formulation requires some sort of optimization of the flow rate ratios and the concentrations of, of each lipid that you're using. Um, the AMP system has been shown as, with phosphorexic data, as you've seen today, to have upwards of 95% of encapsulation efficiency. Um, there's not much more I can say about that, really. But um, Foss, uh, yeah. Nick, do you want to Thank you. the mouse in vivo bit? Nick B, can you, can you comment a little bit on the uh, the design of the rodent studies that we do and how much material it usually requires? Yeah, let's see. So I guess it depends on the study. Um, but for example, I guess we've used as little as, as one to three mix of, of RNA. You know, we can basically fabricate that by running multiple back-to-back -back batches on the, using the microfluidic system, right? And we can collect that material. Basically, we can pool it, right? Whether it's even just using dialysis and in my centrifugation, or I, more ideally, I pool it and, and process it downstream using TFF into a single batch. And likewise, yeah, that's definitely is a viable approach. Um, but in terms of yeah, the, the absolute amount of material, it's it's going to depend on you know your target dose, right? How many animals, um, you know, what your study design looks like on the in vivo side. Um, but overall, it's definitely doable to fabricate the material using the AMP and and whether it's dialysis or TFF, kind of process the material and have it you know be clean and and worthy of an in vivo study. Thank you very much, Nick Carabin. Can you take the next one about the stability? For the stability of LNP, at which stage do you add cholesterol and PEGs? But maybe there was another question. Maybe you can comment a little bit in general. What do we do to improve the stability of the final LNP drug product? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, love to take that question. So first of all, if you're talking about adjusting your lipid mixture, your lipid packet, as we would refer to, you would want to do that fairly early on in the study. I wouldn't suggest you know, identifying a, an LMP lipid packet and then adding on additional components once you've already optimized based off of size and looked at your flow rate ratios. So to do that optimization off of size and encapsulation efficiency, you're gonna to wanna to start with your, your end target lipid packet in mind. Uh, as far as what we do at Phosphorex, you know, we think stability is a critical component of these formulations. I, I think, you know, we've had several experiences in which we've seen people kind of get hung up just on efficacy and tolerability alone when they do maybe their initial screening. Uh, but stability is almost equally as important in that equation, right? Uh, because if you prepare a, an efficacious formulation that later on down the road you determine, you know, isn't very stable, you're gonna have to go back to that process and completely reformulate. Uh, so we would suggest basically looking at those three aspects as, as kind of the three pillars of your formulation during the selection process uh, and weighing them equally such that as we start this process of trying to optimize that maybe the size of your particle, uh, you're in parallel looking at formulation stability at let's say 4C or minus ADC as well. Uh, so I think uh, one thing to keep in mind and one thing that I would stress to, to individuals looking to select a formulation for, for scale up is keep stability in mind very, very early on in that process. Thank you, thank you, Nick. Nick Boylan, um, can you take this one. I think the video gives a good example on screening different flow rates. Thank you very much. Uh, if I'm correct, could you please share more insights on how to screen other formulation parameters such as cationic excipients, lipid cargo ratio, flow ratio between aqueous and organic things? Okay, beautiful. Yeah, excellent question. Yeah, and as we showed with our kind of model data set, um, essentially you, you can at least narrow down, right, the, the flow rate ratio and total flow rates that, that you want to assess. And, and so essentially in this case, let's say we, we, we selected a total flow rate of four mils per minute and a flow rate ratio. And in this case, even in general, a ratio of three is, is pretty standard and acceptable. And so under those conditions, um, yeah, we could basically calculate our, our lipid packets 
And, and these could be varying, yeah, the, the type of ionizable lipid at a given mole percent and, and say, you know, 50% is pretty standard for your ionizable lipid. Um, but even with a single ionizable lipid, right, we could adjust that up or down. And since this is a, a four component LMP system, right, containing the, the ionizable lipid, cholesterol, helper lipid, but also the PEC lipid, um, there's a pretty vast space that could be explored, right? Um, but again, on the system, you, you know, you could basically set up your total flow rate and your flow rate ratios that you want to stick with. And then you would basically just calculate, you know, for each lipid packet, you know, how much kind of ionizable lipid you re would require, how much cholesterol, uh, how much helper lipid, how much kind of peg lipid. And you'd have to prepare these separately. Um, but then you could do kind of uh, individual runs on the system where you would load your, your car, excuse me, your lipid loop with your your lipid dissolved in ethanol, right? So you inject your, your sample loop with your lipid phase, and then you could run kind of multiple experiment, experiments kind of back to back, adjusting the total flow rate or flow rate ratio. And then once that experiment is complete, right, you pull those samples off the instrument, and then you'd be ready to set up your, your next lipid packet. Um, and you'd basically proceed in that fashion. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Keith, here's the uh, question for you. Do you have temperature control on this device? Can you um, talk about yeah. this? Currently, maybe... we, mm -hmm. yeah, currently we, we do not have temperature control. It is something that's on our radar. Um, and if people need it immediately, it's definitely something that um, I would recommend getting in contact with us um, and we can help find solutions to it um, if, if it's meant that is a blocker for you at the moment. Thank you. Anything from phosphorex on the downstream and how we control the temperature through the process? I, I, I don't really have anything to add on that topic at this point. I think uh, it's exciting to hear that Dolomite is actively working on kind of a, a way to provide temperature control during the manufacturing. Right now, we basically have our samples either on a hot plate or kind of a, a warm water bath ahead of time or the cargo on ice so that way we kind of have a set start point for our temperature uh but as kate pointed out solutions or, or opportunities are in the works to to basically control that temperature during the manufacturing uh which is something that we really have into our capabilities as well thank you so uh probably we are at the top of the hour probably one of the last questions we spent a lot of time today talking about lipid nanoparticles but the question is, can you talk about application to other nanoparticles, polymeric and, and any other pretty much uh, um, natrix? So Nick Boland, can you talk a little bit about some of our experience in working on non-lipidic nanoparticles? Yeah, absolutely. So, so in terms of polymeric particles, with the system, and in this case, you know, you just need to identify what's your suitable solvent. And this could be something like THF, for example. Um, and then this would be applicable, say you want to make like a PLGA nanoparticle. And then obviously you need to select your anti-solvent. But again, this could just be pure water. And so we've definitely, so one, one nice thing about the system is you, you do have four pump channels, right? So on, on a single system, we routinely run using kind of pump channels one and two, our kind of LMP workflow. And then we have a, a separate set of basically tubing and a separate chip that we run for our polymeric nanoparticle. And we drive that set of chips uh, using our, our pumps uh, three and four effectively. And again, one pump will be driving your anti-solvent and the other pump would be driving your, your solvent, THF in this case. And, and just very similar to the example that Nick provided today, you know, we could basically dissolve our, our polymer at a known concentration you know, and, and inject that into the sample loop and, and basically fabricate and vary the things like uh, total flow rate and also flow rate ratio. And in this case, you, you know, you might also want to consider uh, inline dilution to further dilute that product and, and solidify the particles. Um, but, but yeah, it's certainly all doable and, and there's a lot of room to explore there as well. Thank you. So maybe one last question we'll take for analytics. Will you able to tell the composition of each, of each lipid component in the final product. Let me take that. Absolutely. So we de develop analytical methodology 
for each individual lipid components. So for the uh, for the cholesterol, for the helper lipid, for regulated lipid, and to compare the processes we were trying to stress, we need to know for sure what is the composition of the final product vis-a-vis -vis of initial components and also what's happening during each unit operation. During TFF or during um, filtration or something, you want to make sure you're not stripping one more than another. So it's really important to know that. Uh, unfortunately, we were not able to answer all your questions. Thank you for the great questions. It was a great discussion. We really, every time, we learn from you. Hopefully, you're learning from us. Our commitment is we'll get back to you, uh, to each person with, uh, with answers to your questions. And we are really excited about being in this field and hearing about and working with you on your projects and helping to advance nanotechnology platforms forward. Thank you very much for your time and we will be in touch. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.